Um, as I said, welcome. We are here today talking about Neuralink and its first human subject, although I think between the time that um, the panel topic was decided on and today, Neuralink actually has a second human subject, so we can expand the conversation a little bit. Um, my name is Amy Stepanovich. I am the Vice President for U.S. Policy at a Washington, D.C.-based think tank called the Future of Privacy Forum. Um, I am going to momentarily let the people on my left introduce themselves. I want to say for the camera, though, before we got started today, we asked our wonderful people who are here with us if they thought that um, brain-computer interfaces were more creepy or more cool. And I think between the two, we got a lot more on the cool side, but when we asked how many people were in the middle, I think that was most of the room. So most people are pretty evenly split in this room, and we're going to see maybe if we ask at the end if people have changed their mind a little bit. So we're going to get started. Hi, I'm Jessica Gale. I have a PhD in experimental neuroscience. I'm a professor of, a, of a psychopharmacology and neuroscience at Pepperdine University. Um, I'm also a science advisor for movies and television for Marvel and Disney and several other things. Um, yeah. Uh, hard to follow a neuroscientist. I, I um, now feel very underprepared to be on this panel. My name is Corey Rosenberger. I'm an assistant district attorney in the Conasauga Judicial Circuit. I've been practicing law for a decade now, um, and I've been closely following the, the Neuralink, um, at least what the Google can tell me. Can you say for the people here who might not know what Conasauga is? Conasauga is uh, Whitfield and Murray County. Um, it's in the northern end. It's the second to last county on I-75 before you get to Tennessee. Uh, good morning, I'm Phil Pornell. I uh, spent 26 years in the Navy. Five of those years was at a place called the Office of Net Assessment, whose purpose was to try and understand the future security environment 23 years in the future. Uh, so we actually wrestled with a number of these things like 10 years ago. Um, I'm also, uh, I'm now a defense analyst and uh, also an aspiring science fiction author. Thank you all. So no um, end of expertise, I think, from many different perspectives here. Um, before we get into Neuralink specifically, what I want to do is start with just what are brain computer interfaces or BCIs. I'm sure that acronym will be used quite a lot up here in the next hour. Um, what are they? What are the use cases? Well, they've been around for quite a while. Uh, the idea is like it's sort of it's sort of like a pacemaker for your brain, the same way we can have electronic pulse for your heart and keep it going at a normal rhythm. If your pacemaking neurons are damaged in the cardiac area, uh, you could do that for the brain. Um, the, some of the first ones were to implant stuff in the brain to, um, to move prosthetic limbs. Um, you could put in the part of the brain that plans out movements and makes movements, you could put a implant in there and let it uh, signals coming out of it go to a limb to control that limb, but it, they had very low technology and sort of a gross motor movement with that, but uh, the idea is to get some better specificity in there and to get it more. But you, you could put you could have put a pacemaker eventually in the future, I suspect that they're probably going to put pacemakers in areas of the brain that are lacking in certain neurotransmitters, certain chemicals in there. So if you find out I mean, this is a ways down the line. But let's face it, if they want to get it approved by the government, what they're going to do is they're going to pick these worst case scenarios that nobody can disagree with. They're going to find a, a veteran that had some terrible accident and, you know, why would we not help them? But then they'll start expanding it to regular people with, with psychological problems or mental problems that are a lot less sympathetic to the government. And there'll be things like, well, this person doesn't make enough serotonin, which is one of your happy neurotransmitters. So we'll, if we put a pacemaker in there, they'll make enough dopamine or serotonin, and then they can feel normal and not have to take, say, an antidepressant. You know, it's going to do the same thing, except it'll do it electronically. And you can dial it up or down from the outside and maybe with less side effects. So I suspect that that's where they're going with that. But for now, it's mostly just moving limbs and, yeah, moving limbs and cursors. So the um, so it's kind of like two elements there. I have seen the literature on how these implants, like you say, like kind of like a pacemaker in the brain to connect portions that aren't working properly, it actually disrupts um, negative uh, neuron oh, connections and other yeah. other other efforts uh, um, like that. So that's in terms of like 
assisting the brain to do its functions uh, properly. And then, you know, uh, on top of that, we mo move towards these uh, um, motor controls. And you have both invasive and non-invasive mechanisms to do this. So the neural link, there's actually these really tiny wires made out of gold uh, that they implanted in the patient's uh, brain. But there are other non-intrusive uh, mechanisms to do something similarly. And I, I told him his ears were going to be burning later. Uh, Dr. Hansen is here in the room who's uh, actually done quite a bit of work in that, uh, in that area for both invasive and non-invasive uh, um, uh, mechanics like this. The, the problem with the, the brain, <laughs> weird, weird sentence to start with, but it's early and I've only had half of a copy. Um, the weird problem with the brain is that it is uh, very densely packed and very curvy. So the technology that we've been typically using has always been straight and hard. And it's, it's hard to get the targets where they need to go if they have the little stimulating wires. They were either using um, straight wires, which couldn't necessarily uh, bend with the, your, your brain is kind of like loose set jello. Everybody always thinks of the brain as like it is in the movies where, you, you know, somebody pulls it out and it's like the brain that ain't New York and you could hold it in your hands. But that's, those kind of brains have had like fixatives and waxes and other things added to them so they could be solid. Your, your real brain is like, uh, loose set jello. Like imagine you for Halloween made a, a brain jello mold and you pulled the mold before it was done setting and it just kind of bleh, under its own weight and you pick it up and it would just kind of run through your your fingers. You would want that to be the case because if you are making new live neural connections as we speak, which you are if you're learning new things and I hope you are at DragonCon, then uh, you want those pathways to be able to connect through that medium easily. You don't want it to be like marble where the poor neurons have to jackhammer through the pathways, you know, to find each other to make a connection. So you've got this nice loose set jello, but that means that hard targets, uh, hard, hard implants are going to be hard to get in there without A, damaging stuff that goes through it, and B, if you want it to get it to a curved area, how do you do that? Do you do a curved needle? That makes the surgery more difficult. You kind of want, um, thin bendy needles uh, or thin bendy electrodes, but that's hard to place where they need to be placed. Um, the fact that they started to use soft ones for this is great, but they, the, the ones that are soft enough to get where they need to go around corners are also so soft that you can't insert them. It'd be like trying to sew with a, with a cooked spaghetti needle. It would just, it wouldn't go in. So this has a, a, like a guide needle that goes in, microfine guide needle that goes in, they put the, the soft lead in there into the brain and then they withdraw the guide needle and it stays there. But then that, now that you know that, it kind of explains why they had a couple of those um, leads retract and they got less specificity in that one particular area because the leads were starting to retract. But given how bendy and floppy a brain is, I am not at all surprised that a few of the leads, you know, traveled or moved or bent or, or you know, snaked their way back out in the same direction. But so that makes it hard. And in terms of um, invasive versus non-invasive, your brain is very dense and there's, there's pathways that you need to reach that are way down in there. And trying to reach that from the outside is, I mean, it, I guess it would, a good analogy would be like trying to communicate with somebody on the 18th floor of the Marriott from the, from the top of the 46 or whatever. You know, you're, you could try to stand on the roof and communicate down to them, but you're communicating through layers and layers and layers of floors, all of whom are talking at the same time, and you're not going to get the kind of specificity you would as if you... I don't know, to just beat my analogy to death, you, you lowered like one of those tin can telephones down to the floor you're trying to get to, and that person can talk to you from the roof. But from the outside to the inside with a deep, deep multi-floor brain, it's hard to, to get in there. I'm sorry, that was a lot more than you probably wanted, but hopefully. Um, I am not sure if I regret having eaten breakfast before this, or if I'm glad I didn't wait until after. <laughs> I like truly has like the um the visuals there I think are some of the best descriptions mm -hmm. that I've had. Like it it really hits home. I'm unfortunately my super but they really oh, sorry the, the best descriptions I've heard. You'll never eat jello again. That might not be a bad thing. Uh but when I joined the Future of Privacy Forum um back in 2022, I, so I take no credit for this. This was a work product that had already been um queued up for publication. They were about to publish with IBM a report on privacy in the connected mind. 
And the definition that they included in that report, um, I want to read off and see if, if you plus or minus um, what was written. Again, I take no credit and no accountability for what is in this. Um, BCIs are computer-based systems that directly record, process, or analyze brain-specific neurodata and translate that, these data into outputs, which can be used as visualizations or aggregates for interpretation or reporting. Um, BCIs can be broadly divided into three categories, those that record brain activity, those that modulate brain activity, or those that do both, called bidirectional BCIs. Is that helpful? Um, if anybody after this panel wants to do another deep dive into what these are and read through there, that is available on our website, um, Privacy and the Connected Mind. And I want to then take this opportunity. Now we, we know what a BCI is. We, we've taken the people who are um, newbies coming into the room um, and pivot straight to Neuralink specifically, which is a very specific brain-computer interface um, that now has two human subjects. How does Neuralink specifically fit in? We talked a little bit about uh, what it is and how it's an invasive BCI. What other um, unique things should we know about Neuralink specifically? From the neuroscience, it has a lot more uh, leads. It's sort of like having a television or a monitor with greater resolution. Typically, they only had ones with, you know, tens of leads, and this one has a thousand leads. Uh, that go into various areas. It gives you a better specificity. Um, uh, it's, to, to use the, the Marriott analogy, it would be the equivalent of, imagine you could send a lead down to each of the 48 floors. You could only have one representative, on average, tell you their opinion from each floor of the Marriott going up. You would not get the kind of specificity of, of, of messaging that you would if you could send 10 leads to every single floor and get a, a better picture. Rather than trying to average out the opinion of a floor, you could get a lot more specificity of what's going on. And that's why multiple leads, it's, it's, better, it's better resolution of what's going on. And that way, the movements will be a lot less sort of gross movements and a lot more specific to, um, with that kind of dexterity. So I think the key there is this is the most, in, most intrusive means that has been created to date. But it is certainly not the first time no. systems like this have, have been created and, and, and employed. Yeah. And in the case, in this case, um, they purposely chose uh, people who are quadriplegics, um, given their risk profile. Uh, that uh, the goal here is try and improve their their quality of life um, because of the. You know, the conditions that they're in. It's also the no, uh, interesting note. I, man, it was hard, hard as as on the neuroscience side, it was hard finding actual hard medical information. They're very tight lipped about exactly where in the brain they place these things because it's all proprietary and they're not publishing peer reviewed research from this. They've got a white paper there, which took me forever to track down um, about w exactly what they're doing with this. But um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's actually hard finding information in there. Um, so I do like referencing written materials. We have a white paper that is difficult to track down. Um, gotta love the internet. Um, I will add two more. So Wired actually ran a story in May, 2024 with the first human subject, the, um, the person for whom this panel is named, who is in fact a quadriplegic. Um, it was an interview that he did about his experience. Um, having the Neuralink BCI, um, he discussed that there were issues. We talked about how some of the threads came out. Um, he talked about how they were addressing that with software and it was improving um, and said that he was actually willing to keep it in as long as they would let him keep it in um, if they didn't want to make him um, remove it so that they could start analyzing the data and look at it with somebody else. Um, then uh, Bloomberg reported on August 22nd, so just a few days ago, um, and I'm going to quote this, Elon Musk's brain computer company said surgery for its second implant in a human went well, and the patient is now able to design 3D objects and play video games like Counter-Strike 2. Um, the second individual is also, I, I'm going to say presumably quadriplegic, because I couldn't, they say... I did find that they're both quadriplegic, okay. and, and that's what I was thinking. They, they're picking quadriplegic because 
it's it's pretty uh, dramatic for the fundraising rounds. Uh, but they're also picking it because they really want people with um, no brain damage where the damage is elsewhere. Because if you have a degener degenerative disease, like I, I figured that one of the first things they do is, is work on uh, Parkinson's disease. But Parkinson's, you're constantly at uh, fighting with the neurodegeneration of Parkinson's disease. You put a pacemaker in there, but it, it, you're fighting against that. They want something, somebody with young, healthy, otherwise, and no brain damage. So they have not released the identity of this individual, so we're not going to get an interview. Any oh, wait, they do have his name. First name, right? Oh, it's first name. First name. First name. Yeah. We have a first name. Um, and actually, I'm glad that you verified that because the, the press release for Neuralink actually said, we want to have this with quadriplegics first, but never actually said the patient was. So I was uh, trying yep. to, to connect the dots there. Um, so I want to discuss implications for this. And I divided those implications into a few different buckets, um, health, policy, and security. Um, and we can take each of them in turn. We can add on to these. Um, we can talk through some of the technical implications if we want to. Um, and as we start this discussion, you will see, um, for those of you in the audience, there is a mic in the middle of the room. If you have questions and would like us to add something to this conversation, do feel free to come up. Um, and as we um, hit lulls between our panelists' comments, we will invite you into the conversation as well. Um, so let's talk about, um, I said that we would start with health and location. What are the things for two people now who have Neuralink um, implanted? What are the health issues that we should be thinking about here? So the immediate you know, physical health issue is uh, the brain not treating the electrodes as an in, in, invasive, you know, an invasion invader that needs to be expelled, right? So that's the first one is just to keep the body from, from tearing them apart. The second element that I would be concerned about, <laughs> if I was using the theme from um, both the fealty and uh, some of the other Larry Niven's work, he predicted a, a human machine interface is not the only story that ever, you know, that ever had it. Um, but he also, in his other works, talked about um, wireheads, people in which uh, the electrode is basically tied to the pleasure center of the brain. And, uh, you know, rather than using narcotics, uh, you just get the good stuff straight out. And so uh, now for these folks who have serious quality of life issues, uh, that might be worth the risk, but there are dangers. Uh, you know, we've, we, we've already seen um, the decline of the attention span of folks with our phones, right, constantly uh, have access to them. Um, what if you can't put down your phone? Because in this case, it's an intrusive system. Hopefully there's some sort of, uh, I can turn it on and turn it off, or there's a timer so that eventually it turns off because then you effectively become a, a wirehead. It's not directly connected to the pleasure center, but uh, as you use the manipulations to, you know, in the game, et cetera, spending too much time on the, on the game, et cetera, which has its own pleasure elements to it. So you have this danger of the, um, you know, this, this what, what I'll call a, a, a viridiate, you know, VR idiot, right? Someone who's like constantly stuck in the VR world. And if you can't turn it off, um, that has some serious mental and physical health uh, 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 challenges. And as we, if this technology moves beyond just the uh, serious cases of quality of life to, to general population, that is a serious uh, um, danger for the general population. I think they're going to really consider where they put these implants. Um, I am less, uh, I am less concerned about the any, any addictive properties where they're putting these because they're putting them in movement planning areas, mm -hmm. uh, which is just like looking at what parts of the brain fire when you move, when you think about moving, mm -hmm. and then place them there. So I don't think. I mean, other than the fact that the, you know, the guy's thrilled, one of the guys is thrilled that he's able to play games again because he previously had the only way he could play video games. And I think it seems to me that they're picking video game players. I was talking to my husband about this last night. They're picking video game players uh, because I think they already had 
a love of technology and playing. And because I think they knew that as part of this, you know, they're, they're giving them these treatments uh, as part of this study plan, but they have to spend a certain amount of time um, playing and practicing with the equipment to train the, the technology to understand their thoughts and translate that into movement. But with video game players, they're so interested in getting back to playing video games that the, one of the patients is spending almost double the amount of time he's required to in training on personal time learning to play chess and, and, um, and uh, shooting games and stuff like that. And for him, it was a big deal because he used to have to control with a mouth controller. He used to have to control the movement with a mouth controller, but the shooting with a puffer straw, you know, you know oops, sorry, little puffer um, with the straw. And uh, now he can hook up the movement part of the video game to his implant and then just control the shooting. And he's like, I'm beating people. I'm beating my friends now. And a quadriplegic should not be beating their friends at video games, which is really cool. So there's a psychological um, you know, state of life. And then there's also the health state of life. But when we start to get when, if, when. Uh, if it's for profit, when when we get to the point where we're starting to put implants in in uh, more more risky areas of the brain, I don't mean risky as in the whole the whole brain is risky, but I mean uh, like the dopamine areas in the brain. Dopamine is got is responsible for a couple of things. It's responsible for pl your pleasure system, and it's also responsible for movement in certain pathways. People with Parkinson's disease have damage in that area, and their brain isn't um, able to make smooth movements. They can make the movements, but they shake, and they can't control their posture and things like that. When we start putting a pacemaker into that part of the brain to trigger more dopamine to help those little neurons do what they should be doing, and we don't know why they're dying, but they are, too much dopamine is associated with schizophrenia, paranoid schizophrenia, uh, drugs of abuse, addiction, and stuff like that. So what's the difference between I have Parkinson's, dial it up a little bit from your perspective, dial it up a little bit, oh, my Parkinson's is gone. Woo, we start getting into the woohoo territory here and then can become addicted to that. If that's paranoid and sch paranoid schizophrenia-like, then how easy would it be for someone to dial it up to addiction, how easy would it be to dial it up to like speed freak? And how easy would that be maybe for someone to hack? I attended a, a, a talk um, a while ago on, on hacking implants. And could somebody dial it up from the outside and make you super aggressive or violent? You would have no idea why you're doing it. You just sort of kind of go schizophrenic. And that, that scares me a lot more than, than neural links right now. Yeah, but my concern was, but there is a certain amount of pleasure just from playing games. I mean, I used to yes. oh, spend yeah. and, hours doing it. My wife's like, you know, we have some children we need to take care of. Like, <laughs> okay, so put these things aside. But if you can't, I think that's why they're doing it that way. if you can't put it down. Yes. Yes. But it, it, in reality for this, it's probably the video game playing that's the addictive thing, not the, not the implants. But they very carefully can claim that. <laughs> I'm hearing a bit on addiction, a bit on... Um like physically rejecting um, a bit on actually creating, maybe artificially creating some um, mental syndromes um, through artificially dialing things a different way. Um, we have a question just real quick before I get there, because I'm not a doctor and I don't know this side. Could the injection of the, um, the threads or whatever interface it is actually create damage to the brain that leaves the patient worse than they were when they started? Or is that something that we're not too worried about? Yeah. It, it could, depending on where they're putting it. Given that the, the um, movement areas of the brain where they're implanting this are conveniently mostly right up at the top, uh, well, down this way. And um, so they're, they're pretty easy to get to, but when you start getting to um, things that are deeper in the brain, you're gonna have to damage stuff on the way down there to get there, it's a, it's a 3D object. Um, but hopefully these microfine fibers and the fact that the place they're placing things are not working currently. So if you put stuff through them, you know they're not gonna get any worse than they are. But when you have to go through something to get somewhere else, then yeah, that's always a risk. So deep brain stimulation with Parkinson's is about 40 years old. Um, one of the side effects of Parkinson's is a loss of affect. And so these are people who cannot emotionally react. 
at a um, neurotech forum about five years ago, we saw a patient who had had an implant, I think it was in Caudate, um, and it restored her ability to emotionally react. Now, one of the questions she was asked was, if we could put a dial on your stimulator to turn it off, turn it on, or set it to a midpoint, would you do it? She said no. Her husband said yes. <laughs> and so my question for you is, do you think that the ability to dial an implant is valuable or is it a risk? You know what immediately comes to mind? Because I don't have a poker face. Does anybody else here like I cannot control my reaction? Like immediately I would be like, yes. <laughs> Let me be able to like limit my reactions to things. And then I think about actual literal poker players or people who, who need to limit their reactions because it's part of gambling or, or winning. And this becomes like almost an unfair competitive advantage in some way. That's the immediate thought that I have. So there was a very short lived television series on, on sci fi, a bionic woman, the last like half a season or something like that. Katie Sackloff, you know, before she started flying around in armor, uh, was the victim of a hack of her brain uh, when she was the first, uh, um, so she became the antagonist, to uh, uh, the first patient of the bionic uh, uh, process, and then the second character um, was the uh, protagonist for it. But the key, a key element of the story was that her brain had been hacked, and so she would do violent things towards uh, 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 someone, particularly her, what she saw as a romantic rival. Um, and so, uh, you know, so if you have a system like that that can be adjusted, then if I have the mechanisms to gain control of your controller, uh, I now have the means to uh, hack your brain. Uh, I may not be able to control all your thoughts, but I could probably um, manipulate your emotional state until you do something irrational. You know, the longer I'm in tech policy, the more I am on channels that sound like they're sci-fi, but they yeah. are so incredibly realistic threats. Uh, because we already know we've seen people hacking pacemakers, and you describe this as a pacemaker for your brain, so we know this is not far-fetched to talk about hacking into somebody's brain. But, like, 12-year-old me would have been very confused about sitting up on this panel today discussing this as an as a honest threat. And then there's the other condition of, for those systems, they're obviously dependent upon power, cell service, okay. Wi-Fi, right? And then there's the associated uh, uh, inv invasion uh, 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 channels for invasion along those, uh, those, those elements. So how, how truly mobile are you with these systems without getting hacked? Like, do you have to stay within a particular domicile? Because as soon as you step out, someone's going to... How do you tooth back to your brain? Like... Oh, is it uh, a Johnny Mnemonic? It is. Yeah, yeah. So for, for those of you who don't know, I feel like this is one of my jobs as a moderator. Two factor is that thing that you get when your phone gets a code before you sign into your account. That is it really you factor. trying to do this? You know, be verified. Being of my existence because I work in a classified environment, so I have to go out to get the code, run back to my desk. Uh, think, think of all the things that are fire hydrants, or you know, like think of all the things that are crosswalks. So I feel like we have almost seamlessly gone into policy implications for this. Um, let's continue that conversation, but we have a couple of questions too. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, from a messaging and talking people perspective, I was wondering if you guys had any advice on how to talk about brain hacking, because especially in the context of Dragon Con and your conversation, I think, oh, oh yeah, you hack someone's brain to make them angry. That's in cyberpunk. It costs, you know, this. It's like it kind of goes into these tropes and your brain goes down that path. We're like, yeah, this is a fun game. That was awesome when I was 15. Not this is a nightmare reality. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you guys had any thoughts on how to kind of message that and talk about that. That's that's like playing Call of Cthulhu when you're a teenager. And then when you have children, you kind of go, I'm not so sure I really want to play this game. I, I, think, it, I think I will feel better about the, pros the prospects when I um, 
look at where the implants are in terms of the risks factor. Like the, right now, the worst case scenario for a Neuralink hack would be you move, you move his cursor around. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to be able to move his arms around because the bridge is out of the spinal cord between his brain and his movements. So even if you were to hack that, it's not like you're going to puppet him. But what if you did have somebody with epilepsy and you have a brain jammer in the brain? Uh, epilepsy is basically an electrical storm in the brain and your neurons just suddenly start, some group of neurons just starts making trouble and shooting out, neuro, uh, shooting out electricity. You can jam that signal and make sure it doesn't um, spread like wildfire in the brain. But then where do you put that? Often that's put in hearing areas of the brain. Temporal lobe epilepsy is one of the most common kinds of epilepsy. What do you have access to in there? Um, words, uh, understanding language, producing language, uh, some deep into the emotional core. What if instead of just sort of making you angry or not, you, you hit the emotional core, you could probably dial up everything so that every memory is like a traumatic event. You could dial it up so somebody just goes instantly into fight or flight because everything feels super panicky. So for now, the locations in the brain, I don't worry so much about hacking because they're, they're not really, you know, if you dialed it up or down, you're not going to make something terrible happen. But when we start talking about emotional core, dopamine, temporal lobes, and other places for implants, I might get a little bit more concerned about that. Research frequently is directed by how marketable something is. Yeah. I just want to point out, I can get your, your Netflix for free if you give me access to your dopamine tap and allow <laughs> me to ping that thing during uh, product placement. Nielsen parts. rating straight from the brain. Yeah. So That you, guy says he doesn't like Real Housewives, but he likes Real Housewives. <laughs> well, if I ding that thing every time there's a product placement that serves in lieu of ads that otherwise you would have watched for free. I can see that. At the bottom of that 500 page EULA that you all just clicked, you know, you already agreed to this, so. It, it's funny you mentioned that. That's one of the things I've thought about um, in preparation for this is the type of people that are getting these implants right now are it, it, not very desperate, but yeah, um, in, in law, it's called a contract of adhesion. Um, and so, you know, take it or leave it. But really, I know you, you have to have this thing. Um, and I can see that being a huge risk uh, is people just signing all their rights away. Um, HIPAA, um, you know, it, it, anything that you are legally allowed to sign away, um, I would imagine a quadriplegic would sign away in order to get this to, to have access, and it, especially as it improves in the future. To the extent that it's co it's coercive. I mean, for for neuroscience research or any kind of psychological research, you can't offer excessive incentivization, or else it's considered a coercion. And at the point where you're like, how'd you like to be able to at least in VR run through a city and and play video games like you used to? That that's coercive to a to to a quadriplegic. There is um a, re a really popular framing for privacy laws that has taken up um, globally. It's, there's a law introduced right now in Congress on this that wants to give you privacy rights by saying you own your data. Um, it, it sounds really good when I say it outright, but the thing is with owning something is you can then sell that thing or you can rent it or you can license it. Um, it is no longer something you have a right in. It is something that is property that you can give away. Um, and when it, we start thinking about your brain information as something you can sell and give away, um, the capacity for manipulation, for um, taking advantage of very vulnerable populations to get access to sensitive information, all of a sudden that becomes um, much more significant than when we're talking about um, even what we would today consider sensitive data, like um, an address, a credit card number, health information, like your brain information, I think is a step even further than the things that we already think, oh no, I really don't want um, some random company having all of my health records. Or knowing I like Real Housewives. Or knowing you like Real Housewives. I was wondering if you could speak to, um, like specifically where this is taking place and like what kind of IRB approval or oversight that this is kind of the return there. You said no peer-reviewed paper. Is there um, institutional review board, IRB review, which is typically with um, human subjects research required? 
they did have to do that with the humans, and they did have to, in theory, go with IACUC, which is the uh, uh, Animal Use Committee. It's basically the equivalent of an ethics board for animal research. And they, they signed off on it, but um, there's not very much oversight, and I think it is extremely suspicious that out of the eight doctors that started with the program, only two are still in the program, and the rest have failed. Now, I don't know whether they're NDA'd. I don't hear a lot. I tried to do a deep dive and look for why they bailed, but the only information we're getting out is they feel that, uh, sorry to the Elon bros in the audience, or sisters, whatever, um, that that Elon is pushing things too fast beyond the normal pace of science. And I understand that's what innovation requires. That's how SpaceX works, move fast and break things. Uh, does work sometimes, but when you're talking about brain implants, maybe move fast and break things is not the, the mantra we should be using. Brain. Yes, let's not break brains. Um, so a lot of them left because things were going too fast. Now, whether yeah. that means too fast for normal scientists, which are very pokey, I get it but too fast in the point where there have been questions about uh, monkey health doing imp implants too quickly. Uh, they got chronic infections because the infection, the, the locations weren't healing. You know, a, a lot of stuff like that um, have been levied. Apparently the Department of Agriculture checked out the facility and, and cleared them of wrongdoing, but there are a lot of ethics watchdogs out there for animal rights that are saying, no, they're not. Now, I don't know where the truth lies somewhere in the middle, I suspect. Uh, hey, so in, in terms of synthesizing the incentives of legality and say hacking certain emotional receptors in the brain, um, what are potential implications that this would have on say prosecutorial approach if mens rea is, could be compromised say by a hacker? Oh, it would be my, it would be a nightmare for me if that became, you know, commonplace if, uh, if, a, a defense for any given defendant was now I have a brain chip. Someone must have hacked me to make me do this. Uh, that is a nightmare, or that would be a nightmare scenario for a prosecutor. Um, additionally, um, I'm, I, I tried to look around for crime, a current crime right now, other than um, just general the computer hacking crime, which I, I don't get a lot of in Dalton, Georgia. But um, uh, there aren't a lot of crimes with with severe enough punishments for hacking someone's brain. Um, I don't think that that exists on a federal level or on a state level right now. And that's something that as soon as that becomes a feasibility, the government needs to, to do something about it. Uh, unfortunately, government's usually de about a decade behind technology. You could fax them recommendations. Yeah. <laughs> you actually can. You say that. I've done FOIA requests that require taxes. I did this super cool event in Hollywood like six years ago, way, way, way back, six, seven years ago. And it was a, with a, the Sloan Foundation, and they paired three scientists with three filmmakers to make short films based on that science, illustrating that science. And I, I did one about addiction in the brain and, and a workaholic people and whatever, but uh, the, there was a, a neural implant one and the short film that came out of that was, you know, it's 2075 and the, the water wars are occurring on the West Coast because there's not enough water with the Colorado and everything like that. Uh, neural implants are everywhere and, there's, and, and, and it opens on a trial scene with this like 65 year old Asian lady on the stand testifying about why she has bombed a water treatment plant and it turns out that somebody has hacked her, her Parkinson's implant to, to dial up her dopamine, kind of make her go berserker and, and why would she would turn that into bombing a water treatment plant is plausible-ish enough for them for filmmaking, but yeah opened with a trial of that and you know that that's an interesting um, point to go to, to balance privacy and justice i think in the end privacy should win um but the need to have like some sort of log or protected log of when you know your implant is being used um, but at the same time if i have that implant i want that to be fiercely fiercely protected um, and only under dire circumstances should the government be able to you know, get a search warrant for my activities. Yeah. Um, and so uh, the, the thing that I can equate it, to, the, the best thing I could come up with is a search warrant for your Google history. 
for your internet search history. Um, it is kind of, I would imagine right now, that is the closest thing to the stream of thoughts um, that a person, um, and the Supreme Court recently upped, they, they would strike down a search warrant that just says, criminals oftentimes use computers to research crimes. You need more than that. Um, you need uh, a, a much higher level just for your internet history. So I couldn't even imagine the level of probable cause or you know evidence that would be needed in order to um, get a search warrant for your brain activity. And and if that should even be recorded and you know memorialized. Uh, two things to introduce here. Um, we did a recent look through. What we wanted to know was if somebody and I always use a toaster for some reason. I don't know if somebody had an internet connected toaster. Battle stop. Maybe. <laughs> Um, and it was, and somebody broke into it, um, and caused it to set fire to, to a kitchen. Is that a computer crime or is that arson? Um, yes. and it widely differs from state law to state law about how that would be considered, which I think is really interesting because you're not going to get the same penalties with a computer crime as with a physical, like an arson crime. Um, the other piece, and then we have a question um, is, um, we were talking about the, the privacy elements, and I've done a lot of work on government hacking requirements. And right now, the government does engage in hacking activities. Um, they, the process they go to do that is a, a branch between a regular search warrant, if it's stored data, and a wiretap warrant, which is often called a super warrant. It's a little bit more than a normal warrant. And they get a combination of both. But hacking, actually, I would say, I think a lot of technologists would say, comes with a lot of increased risks vis-a-vis -vis regular searches, even wiretap searches. And so we've never talked about publicly, we've never really had an engaged conversation about if we need a super, super warrant, an uber, super warrant, but something more for hacking activities by the government to take um, into account these increased risks. And as these new technologies come out that offer new and different streams of information, it might become even more important to have that conversation and, and not less so. So with your last words, I am most concerned about our starting a policy about this type of thing. It appears that we have very little in place and that we need to start, we needed to have started a while ago. So with no policy in place, my biggest concern is not necessarily for, and it's a shame that I should say this, the safety of the individual who gained the implant, but it's the safety of the world itself, simply because there are, we have to look at how this is going to have, what kind of an effect this is going to have on territorial wars on this planet, and eventually in space. But we need to understand how the government's going to use it, whether or not it's, we understand that it probably will use it, and that's probably why it's being dissolved. But with policies in place, will that help at all? So if you all, if I were to give you a congressional blank check, it doesn't mean this, but I'm going to make this up. You got to go in and write a law tomorrow, and Congress would just pass it there, and the president would sign it. In debate, we call that fiat. Sure. Okay. <laughs> um, what would you include in that to pass? And all you're thinking, just for a second, I do want to plug a panel on Saturday morning at 10 a.m. in this room, I believe, on Colorado's neuro right. privacy law. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, spoilers, I'm going to tell you that it doesn't really do a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what what would you pass in Congress tomorrow to try to address some of these issues? I'm going to leave law to the law people. So um, it, essentially everybody kind of knows what your due process, your right to due process is, um, Fourth Amendment right. Certain rights um, that you have constitutionally cannot be waived. Uh, even if you sign a piece of paper that says, you know, I'm giving up, you know, my Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination as part of this plea deal, um, later on, if I were to try to make someone testify, 
their attorney or them, um, if they're smart enough, could stand up and just say, I'm not doing this. I have an absolute right. I cannot waive this right. Um, due process, Fifth Amendment, um, a couple other others, but the privacy of your data, of your brain data, I think, um, should be an immutable right. So it's one that you cannot sign away. And that would that would be my law. I have to agree with you. Intellectual property rights right now are being uh, void by company. So how are you going to do that? So um, yeah. There, there, there's no easy way besides just answering. But in um, so accountability courts um, are a, when you don't go to prison, um, but you need very heavily su heavy supervision. We have something called drug court, um, and drug court is where you give away a whole lot of your rights. But and you, you know, people are always up in your business. Um, but one of the rights that they cannot give up is their right to due process. So if they, if I say Come on, man! I just saw you, you know, you know, smoking meth, and they say no, I wasn't. I can't just, I can't just go to the judge, even though they've tried to sign away that right. Um, and so that that is fairly well protected your right to due process in criminal law, um, even in those kind of ambiguous situations where you're on super probation and you um you know you're being watched all the time you still have the right to say no i didn't do this you have to prove it um and that is very well enforced at least in georgia um and so it would just have to be something from the ground up your right to your thoughts is something that you cannot give give up so you know when elon musk makes a quadriplegic sign all these papers saying you know you give up all these rights all these rights and then, you know, he's selling this guy's data, thought data to Netflix. He can then sue. Um, and I guess you would also need to put some laws in place for severe punishments um, for this as well. Uh, more than just monetary damages, you, you would need punitive damages as well. Um, punitive damages are like punishment versus, you know, what it what is the what is the monetary value of, of Netflix knowing that I like uh, real housewives now. Um, it would need to be more than just that. Mm -hmm. And you. So I, I'm I'm with him in both the uh, substantive and um, procedural due process element here for the um, the most intimate element of a person, which is their thoughts, right? And uh, the Constitution speaks pretty clearly uh, to these things. Um, I'm going to have to hold there. I, I mean, this is this is like a, a lifetimes worth of, of uh, legal examination my wife is the lawyer not me uh, so uh this is why i can you know I, I, the honorary law degree i can speak the language <laughs> but i don't actually have a degree um but i'm gonna have to stick there for the moment of, of uh, uh procedural and uh, substantive due process about person's uh, thoughts and right now I've, I've thought about the interaction between uh, hipaa the health insurance yeah. protection and mm -hmm. Portability Act. Um, HIPAA covers a whole lot. I'm not sure um, if HIPAA would cover thoughts that go through a, a Neuralink device. Um, but not specifically, it does not. Yeah. But it, the HIP, I would imagine that HIPAA could be used as like a, a band aid to cover a, a gushing wound, I guess. But there are um, Washington State, Nevada. Um, as many of you may know, the federal government has not passed a comprehensive privacy law, um, but increasingly states are passing health-specific privacy laws. So Washington State has the My Health, My Data Act. Um, it's a health law, but actually the definition of health information is so broad that it's actually kind of a comprehensive privacy law. Um, and, and the states are starting to put information or protections in place for this um, that go beyond what what is available federally, what's available in other um, legal packages. What is notable is that doing that from a privacy lens and providing rights to that data and not doing it from the intellectual property lens actually takes you out of that ownership model that I spoke about and puts it into a rights-based model um, that allows you a little more. Um, and HIPAA actually People always think when like HIPAA has privacy in it, they often get like, oh, it's a privacy law. HIPAA is a transparency and accountability law that has a privacy rule. 
it, it's not necessarily meant to deal with privacy. So we do need to be thinking about, I think, ways like Washington to be privacy. I'm not, not on the law side, but I always wonder how similar this will be when private industry gets it and will it be more like all those 23andMe uh, genealogy sites where you send away your DNA and you're like, sure, I'd love to be tested for new diseases, sure, and then poof, it's in the FBI's hand and they're using it to find cold case killers and where were my rights to my DNA and how much less private is that than my brain waves? I, I call that 23 and she. Uh, yes. Because <laughs> that's where the sequencing is, is conducted. Really interesting. The FBF actually did with several genetics privacy or genetics genetics company testing companies got together and we're like we want to put in place best practices on privacy to differentiate ourselves from people who are like very predatory and just want to get your genetic information. And they did that. Um, we worked with them to do it, and that eventually got passed into law in several states. So there are genetics privacy laws, and I think that like that again that approach of can we at least provide faith of something? So my question relates to um, the discussion of legal accountability that uh, y'all were having before. Going down the route of assuming that this isn't well regulated and what information we do have can be, or like what information is being recorded can be used. How would you go about linking the data that a system like Neuralink is transmitting and you know, you're know you putting into an archive somewhere. How would you go about linking that data to, say, an action that somebody took, if that's possible? You'd have to have a really good data log. And then you have to protect the data that that, you have to protect the data log and the data that go, goes uh, uh, with it. And we're talking about a lot of data. And I think even before answering that question, I think we need to add, we would need to ask the question of whether this needs to be memorialized or not. And in whether it needs to be recorded and logged um, versus, you know, a, a law requiring that, you know, not store any of this information. Um, again, you would run into the risk of, you know, my someone must have hacked my brain chip. That's why I stabbed this guy. Um, but at the same time, there is the potential for um, a problem with justice and, and a potential for a problem with privacy. And those two clashing um, create, I guess, us as a society will have to decide, you know, which one of those wins. But ultimately, I do think that the privacy would win. It should win. Now, the, the designers are going to come back to you and say, because the widespread neurodivergence, I need to collect all that data so that I can place people in particular categories and use the appropriate coding to that person's um, neurodivergence for the system to work. Right, so now we're off the races, right? Because I have to have, uh, uh, have to collect and 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 all all that data and 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 then do the uh, regression analysis on it to to be able to pick the right category that you brought people into for the the system, the, the operating system to work. Right. So we're talking about a little bit of tension between <laughs> one privacy principle called data minimization, like don't collect things, and use limitation. Okay, you can collect it, but what can then you use it for once you have all of that data? Um, and sometimes you get protections in, in either camp. Hey, good morning. So I've been working for a similar agency, a few improvements for the last decade, and particularly spot nets, GPSs, criminal, cyber criminal collectors, things like that. And so we go back, I've just been listening as far as how do we protect our data on the individual. So we would look at the computer infusion aspect of it. And if nearly CATSI servers, which host all of our information on this server, and we have someone implement that server, it's most likely, put stop, not going to be a US citizen. It's going to be an Asian actor. And so the idea of how do we safeguard that information from nation state actors, from ourselves, that's part one question. Part two question is, Suppose Neuralink goes in someone's head and they see that they want to create this heinous person and they've done every aspect mm -hmm. except for really the act of it. At what part does Neuralink have the responsibility to say, hey, really agency, this person is going to do X, right? And Tom um, Cruise and pre-prime. Right. Yeah. And, 
it sounds funny, but we're not that far away. And when we talk with other partners, and we see that. And so it's a little out of my lane, I'm more in the intrusion side of it. But I think that's our biggest concern is because you think if you think of most say, they're, they're just not. I mean, yeah. there's the, the public data breach, there's thousands of people through social security going where it's out there in nature state right now. So it's just um, Yeah, my social security number is in the hands of the kind of county party. Right. Right, because I served in the military and uh, I got that notice, you know, that my, a lot of my data got uh, breached. And, you know, we have all these contractors who are supposed to work for the government and they're supposed to put all these uh, procedures and safeguards in place and, you know, they fail. Um, and so we can pass all the laws we want. We can argue about our legal jurisprudence, about uh, executing it. And then someone outside who doesn't really care what our laws say. Lest this conversation get too, too scary, I want to remind people that the implants we have right now, I mean, we're talking about tens of implant, tens of threads versus a thousand threads is an order of magnitude, better resolution. But we are still talking about a place in the brain. And what our natural tendency to do, if we don't have a lot of neuroscience background, is to say, well, it's a brain implant. So it knows everything you think in every region. But you got sights down here and sounds and language and movement yeah. and sensations and breathe planning and your personality. And they are very far apart from each other in terms of, I mean, we're talking about microscopic little implants. So the idea of like the government will know my thoughts. Well, this is here and that there and that there, and we're not going to have a full brain implant which knows everything that you're thinking probably ever. So there, there's at least that, you know, like at, at, at worst case scenario in, in the foreseeable future, they might know what part of my body I'm thinking of moving or that I'm thinking about moving my right index finger. <laughs> but, you know, we're not there yet where they're like, she's thinking about planning a crime and it's going to be at the, you know, this courthouse on this date and like yeah fair enough but we are at a science fiction but fiction. but we are we're at a science fiction so let's go plausible ish we are actually at time for the panel um please come up and talk to us remember there's a panel 10 a.m on saturday also about this topic if you want to keep exploring it or something similar um i want to give 10 seconds to each of the people to have you know i hate even using this anymore because it doesn't exist a tweet length final statement um, maybe particularly appropriate for this panel um, about what you would like people to leave with as, as they're walking out the door. That was a longer tweet, Lee. Yeah, just remember, we're not there yet. Don't worry too, too much about that, but do start worrying now. Do, do not consent to anything Elon Musk offers you. <laughs> All right, so shameless plug time, right? So. Um, this is a great uh, anthology about rebel soldiers. Thank you for your service with the great dad deal. Um, there's some great stories in here about uh, some of the topics that we're talking about here. And then there's mine, which is about uh, a conflict in the US and China uh, regarding uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and then it was my uh, father's last book that I helped uh, write and I turned in the sequel, second draft of the sequel. So let's see uh, uh, where that goes. Now, um, as I said earlier, I do wargaming for a living. If you know young people out there that have a STEM degree and can code and are interested in wargaming, come talk to me. I'll give you a pamphlet. Uh, we are definitely hired. There's lots, lots of work to be done. Uh, it is in the DC area, and you do have to be able to hold a class. Thank you, everybody. Happy Dragon Conning. Come back and see us in this room. <laughs>